I'm delighted to be joining you for the next few days to discuss being a teacher, being a maker, being an artist and a craftsman, being a mentor, what it, our job is in helping students and artists become better problem solvers, to discuss critical feedback and how they can see tasks through fruition and to work with others well. That seems to be like sort of the, at the very root level what we're trying to do. An art is a place that people come together. An education is a place where pe people come together. So let's be honest, I have to be honest here. I've been a teacher for a while, about 20 years now, and I've been getting up and heading into the classroom every day since I was 32. However, all of this time teaching, taking attendance, showing students how to make comb packs, finding readings to inspire, and trying to keep the red clay out of the brown slurry bucket, <laughs> still, you all really could teach, teach circles around me. So I want to give credit where credit is due. We do have a similar job, and we do have a different job. I have heard that there is a gulf. There is a large space between K through 12 education and college education. And that in this canyon, of, and in this is a canyon of judgment. Where does this come from, this canyon of judgment? Not from anyone who actually is involved with education and not from anyone who's actually in the know, but still somehow it exists. However, from my own experience, this kind of gulf or canyon or hierarchy is painful. I teach craft in a fine art setting, and I understand how a hierarchy is demoralizing and uninspiring. So let me say right now that I know that this exists, that I know that it doesn't feel good, and let me say on behalf of the hollowed halls of the academy, and on behalf of the dum-dums everywhere, I apologize for us. I do. I am sorry that higher education has a bloated sense of self-importance, of which we cling to desperately, often or sometimes at least at your expense. I teach at the University of Montana, and it seems to me that one of the biggest differences between teaching in a college classroom and a K through 12 classroom has to do with density, has really to do with density. Each week when I'm teaching, I'm stringing parts together. I'm weaving tasks in and out of my day. As a college professor, there's porosity in my week. And although the days are very long, like yours, and the nights are full of work, there is enough room for me to pivot and to move. K through 12 teachers, of course, have long days as well. As well, really nobody stops at three o'clock or 3.45 ever, right? But K through 12 teaching has a density, a compactness, that makes it difficult to move within, caused by standards, classroom size, curriculum justification, standardized testing, and that constant 40 or 50 minute turnover. There's a different kind of intensity in teaching K through 12. I understand that. Of course then, we also come to this question about making art. In my job, if I do not have an active studio practice, I will lose my job. There is no question about that. However, um, this is not true for the vast majority of K through 12 teachers. So where does this take this? This very quickly brings up all of these sort of distracting questions, like do you have to be an artist to teach art, or is your outside of class practice important or not? And I have to say that that ski slope, it's a whole other hillside for us, and it often is detracting and is a determined to um, people working together. How do we feel the hierarchy between K through 12 and college education? It comes from a lot of places. First. Honestly, everybody goes to school up until seniors. They're seniors in high school, right? Like, everybody has that right. So, it's assumed in our society that everybody does this. But when you wanna to go to college, you have to apply. So that already starts to insert hierarchy. And it makes it seem more important and exclusive. Second, often when people go to college, they go away from home. And it is when they start to decept, um, discover who they are separate of their family of origin. So it is seemingly important because there's a level of self-actualization that happens in college, which also sets it apart from earlier teaching. And third, very honestly, you pay to go to college, so it's more violent in society. You gotta fork out the dough. College professors, are college professors more valued than K through 12 teachers? Well, let's start there, right there with that word professor. A professor is defined as a teacher of a higher rank at a college or university to profess, to declare, to announce, to proclaim. Teachers defined as a person who helps to acquire knowledge, confidence, and virtue. I have to say, I'm a teacher. It doesn't really matter where I work. 
Well, that sounds pretty good. But our, tile, our titles already are separating us. When my graduate students say that they want to teach, I say, well, then please enroll in some education classes. And they say, no, 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 I want to teach college, not kids. And I say, why? I say, do you even know enough to make that decision yet? Do you even know what those things mean? And of course they do not, because really they have only been seeing college professors since they can actually remember. So they don't have a direct connection with other kinds of teaching. When speaking with Sarah on the phone, I heard her frustration about hierarchy. In her presentation, she wrote, how often have you been told when you tell people that you teach K through 12 arch to bless your heart? <laughs> or, oh my God, I can never do that job. Or I am so sorry. Somebody's sorry that you have a job. <laughs> I do not hear these things as a college professor. However, I do hear those who cannot do teach, or at least it's better than being a starting artist, A. Eh? <laughs> or my absolute favorite, you had to go to school to teach art? You can get a degree in that? <laughs> Ah, this, my friends, is a dark hole. We can go down this very quickly. And do we really get anywhere? No. We know that the vast majority of the public has absolutely no idea what we do. And through their ignorance, people can be rude, but they mostly really do not mean it. Oh, is that too blurry to read? Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. So these are sort of my favorite um, sort of things that I hear. And uh, last year, about two years ago, when I taught at Anderson Ranch, we had Teachers for President t-shirts made. It was pretty fabulous. So <clears throat> listen, when Barack Obama became president, I was um, actually correcting my tests from Clay and Glaze class, trying hard to remember which side next side fell on, potassium or sodium. And suddenly I heard it right in my headphones. I heard that the president understood the importance of teachers. He said, if you want to help our country, you should become a teacher. He said that, and I absolutely started to bawl. I did not realize that I was in a profession that had been seemingly unsupported until then. So <clears throat> Barack said, no teacher standing in front of a children's classroom could choose this profession because they were promised a big payday or a short work day. I know, don't you hate it when people say, don't you get out at three? Anyways, or that work would be fair or consistent, he says, and that teachers in New York State are generally paid twice as much as teachers in Oklahoma. Obama went on to say, men and women who teach our children fulfill the promise of our nation, and that's always looking, because they're always looking forward. And they believe that each generation has a responsibility to help the next, building this great country forward to make the world a better place. Well, I love these big sweeping statements, right? I can hold that up, I could get that tattooed on my chest. It just warms my little heart. Obama says, we need to make the profession more attractive. Education is a place where people can come together. The Washington Post recently reported on research by the United Nations that showed that the globe is spinning towards a dramatic teacher shortage, with an analytics predicting that there'll be a shortage of 69 million teachers in 10 years by 2030. Depending on what your source is, between 60 and 35% of new teachers leave their job within under five years. The reasons are all the same. Challenging work traditions, facilities in disarray, inflexible curriculum, unrealistic expectations, and lack of support within or outside of the school, stress, or overwhelming lack of respect from students or administrations. However, on the flip side of this, interestingly enough, Teachers gave extremely high marks with satisfaction in their job. They found that over 65% found their job to be quite rewarding, 25 extremely rewarding, and only 10% were ready to kick the bucket. How do we put all this together, these opposing facts? Mostly it just tells us how complicated things are. How do we figure out and still get out of bed in this morning? I started teaching workshops for Cal K through 12 teachers about eight years ago. I wanted to value the K through 12 art teacher as an artist as much as as a teacher. So I have a, a teacher workshop at Anderson Ranch, Haystack, sometimes here in Aramont, and they're only allowed, only K through 12 teachers are allowed to enroll. Even if they're retired, then they're not allowed to come. So uh, my first time I taught, I had the classroom all laid out. Everything was color coded and there was a grid and everybody had like a station and I had laid out their tools nicely and they all came in and sat down and I had set up 
like two projects every morning, and then a demo at noon, and then I had, you know, I had set up like this whole thing. And really within about 20 minutes, it became clear to me that the teachers were rushing through the projects because they just wanted to talk to each other. And my job was to make a place for teachers to talk to each other. So we just started doing that. I stayed the biggest, stupidest assignment I could so that their hands could be moving, so that their mouths could be moving. Do you see what I'm saying? Thoughtfully and slowly. And it was really quite this brilliant thing. Every time I teach the workshop, I have less stuff in the workshop because really they just want to talk. They just want to talk to each other. And I have to say, they need space, teachers need space, teachers need time, and teachers need to speak with teachers. In the beginning, in the beginning, there was a lot, there's a lot of comparison. You get what? And they said what? And then huh? And then how much? And then no way, right? And a lot of sort of diving down to the very bottom of the worst conditions. Teachers in school that had more support get quieter and quieter and quieter. Teachers in school with less support or ones that were burned out got louder and louder and louder. But then it kind of ran itself out. It just ran down. Everybody got their yayas worked out and kind of came into the conversation in a way of which they always meant to, which is talk about learning, okay? So if you gave teachers time and a little bit of space, never in my workshops have I heard so much laughter, ever. So much laughter. Education is a place where people come together. I travel a lot now, at least once a month, and when living in Montana, I've been racking up the frequent fire miles. I just figured out what button to push to use the miles to move me into first class when I travel. <laughs> Being a woman of girth, this has come to mean a great deal to me. <laughs> I have noticed how much my conversations have changed. When I sat in coach, folks really latched on to me being a teacher. Our conversations circled around my university. Since sitting in first class, people are more apt to discuss me being an artist. Amazingly, they're a little bit in awe. They look at my hands as if to see a clue about how one does what they want. How does one make a career? They add, they call me, that they say that I am a master of my domain. I was told that once, it was quite surprising. How interesting is this? When sitting in first class assumes that I'm ex um, successful and respected being an artist, and, over, and overall our conversation was much better. And we never have to talk about the Montana Grizzlies, the football team, or tuition. We all know the benefit of education and that it's clear and it's difficult to track. The career track for artists is also vague and nonlinear. Once I overheard Peter Biesker speaking to a parents of students and their kid wanted to go to art school. They were grilling him on what in the world she was gonna do in four years. Peter said, I don't know what your daughter's gonna do in four years. Much of that is up to her. I can tell you that in art school, she will learn to be a creative thinker. She will become a tremendous problem solver. She will work with others regardless of agreement. She will be able to communicate clearly. She'll learn to work hard, very hard. She will learn to take an idea or a project from beginning to end she will, to fruition, and then she'll be able to evaluate its success, take criticism with, and suggestions with ease, and perhaps most importantly, in four years, your daughter will know herself. Education is a place where people come together. Recently, many four-year colleges have a dropping enrollment. Some of this is because employment <clears throat> is pretty good, so fewer people are going to school. Some of it is because college is expensive. And some of it is simply because the general financial support for colleges from the government, like all school, has dropped since 1988. It is now suggested that recruitment officers start as early as the eighth grade, I'm sorry, as early as the third grade to promote their college to young students. I predict within 15 years, K through 12 educators will have a lot of power because they will be helping figuring out where students go next. That is very useful power. One thing I do find a little bit tricky about arid education now that I've been just singing its praises, I am an overeducated woman who's been teaching for 20 years. And for whatever reason, when I speak to art educators, I get very frustrated. <clears throat> when reading their publications, I cannot understand what they are saying. The rhetoric and self-referential vocabulary that somehow gets mired in the discussion of learning how to teach is absolutely maddening. 
I should not feel stupid when I'm talking to a teacher. I have spoken with K through 12 educators at great length and almost every time an is the issue of time or time management or busyness comes up. We are busy between Instagram, Facebook, 24 hour news cycle, email, text, phones, we all do more and more. Everyone is striving for balance. I do not know anybody who actually has balance. Who I know are people who feel bad they don't have balance. When I stopped worrying about it, everything got much easier for me. I apologize a lot more often. I'm more often late. My spelling has gone downhill, and I have had to pay someone to walk my dog. But mostly, I've stopped worrying about being so darn busy, and somehow in that, I found some ease. I was a pretty serious kid, always looking intently, very intently. I was that kid, right, knitting my brow in the sixth grade. I liked to throw rocks. I was not so funny. In 1995, I finished graduate school and moved to Virginia to build a wood kiln and live on a hillside with a dog near my sister's house, and I was gonna make pots for a living. I took a sabbatical replacement position at the College of William & Mary to get to know people in the area. My first day of class, I forgot that I was the one who brought the syllabus. I was totally startled when I came into class and it wasn't there. So I had to think on my feet pretty quickly, and I stood up in front of class, and much to my surprise, I was entertaining. I could engage the students, and I was actually a little bit funny. Maybe for the first time in my life, I was a little funny. And I was so surprised. And I had one of those lightning bolt moments. If I was a teacher, I would laugh more. I would enjoy people more, and I would have a better life. So I thought, I'm gonna become a teacher. Before that, I had to go make a living as a potter. I wasn't gonna teach potter without that credibility, you know? But that's how I became a teacher. I have a very active studio, oh, sorry. I have a very active studio practice. I always uh, leave work in process, so I have to get back to it, right? That's the only way to truly get work done. I never use the internet in my studio. And um, my studio practice does affect my teaching. But if I'm not making work, I am harder on the students. I'm cranky with them, and I'm pissed at them. I'm pissed at them before class starts. It's ridiculous. I know they're wasting time. I know they're screwing around, and it makes me annoyed. So if I have my studio at practice active, I don't get so annoyed at my students. My teaching influences my studio practice because it makes me do the best I can. I have to show up for my students, so I have to show up for my studio. It's a muscle that I've developed from teaching and it carries into my studio. In addition, teaching gives me great hope for the future and really all of those shiny faces. Talking about shiny faces, I started making pots when I was in high school. This is my high school. And I, before that, I always found solace in the art room. In those rooms of cut up paper and aprons, I found a few minutes to dis disappear or a few minutes to appear. I had wonderful teachers. I don't know if they were honestly good teachers or not, but the truth was they were there and that <laughs> made them good enough. So I have to say, Mrs. Corn, Mr. Riley, Mr. Lerman, Mrs. Lightman, Mrs. Bell and my high school teacher, of whom I named my wheel after in 10th grade, Mr. Lane. I thank you. <clears throat> Charity White states, I'm an artist. I'm an educator. Neither identity overshadows the other. They are inseparable and they enrich one another. As a teacher, I strive for my students to synthesize and translate knowledge. The knowledge brings about understanding. Understanding enhances the pursuit of knowledge through active engagement in visual culture. I push my students to become creators of the world around them. I thank you, Charity. Now this workshop, this our think tank, our next two days are about us as teachers and as makers. So I'm just gonna share with you in addition to this, that's me in high school. In addition to this, um, I'm gonna just share with you a little bit about where my studio practice is. It's gonna, we've been going about 20 minutes. You guys have 20 more minutes in here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So two years ago, this totally shocking thing happened that I turned 50. I'm the youngest in my family, so I always thought I'd be youngest. Like, I was so startled when it happened. Like, I thought I'd be 49 a few times or something. I don't know what. And somehow I had to pop my head up out of the sand, and I had to think, Jewel, like, stop cleaning your belly button. Like, what are you making? What are you doing? What is your life about? You know, there have been so many good potters out there right now. I started to think differently. Right around this time, we lost artist Akio Takamori. And you know, his last show before he died was called Apology and Remorse. 
and he was making all of this work that was based off of imagery of um, prominent figures apologizing. So this is the Chancellor of Germany. Here he is apologizing after World War II. And the um, leader of Korea, of Japan, apologizing after um, World War II. And I was so stunned that if you had four months left to live, that you would make work about apology. It really touched me. And I started to think a lot, like what do I have to apologize for? I don't mean like, Sometimes I'm a bad daughter. Sometimes my dog doesn't get out enough. Sometimes, I, you know, I don't mean like that. I mean like really, what do we have to apologize for? So I was thinking about this quite a bit and right around that time I was listening to a podcast about the wandering albatross. And the wandering albatross is a bird that has, its wingspan is 11 feet across. And when it goes in loft over the ocean out looking for food, which it eats and digests and spits back up for its young, it can stay aloft for 30 days Half of its brain can sleep while the other half is awake. That's why I can stay a lot. Anyways, I was listening to this on a podcast and I was sort of not paying attention. I was in the Minneapolis airport looking for my gate, distracted, my coffee's dripping, like all that stuff. And suddenly the announcer said, we're worried about these because they're getting decapitated on bycatch lines. They're bycatch, they're getting decapitated on fish lines at the rate of one every five minutes. Well, honestly, I had been in the airport for 45 minutes and I became completely horrified and I threw up right there at gate C3. I just threw up, like I had this really instinctual reaction to it. And so I started to think a little bit about what did I actually or my generation have to apologize for? The Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973. I was born in 66, I knew better. I knew better in high school. It was right around this time that we're also was the anniversary of AIDS. AIDS was a huge thing when I was in college. I'm just that age that we didn't know what AIDS, uh, AIDS were. Uh, we thought it was like a cancer. We didn't know why it was only affecting gay men. And for the most part, it was affecting populations that were invisible, unless it was very close to your family or you. So <clears throat> I became very interested in this idea about when something is invisible, how it happens. And then when it becomes visible, it stops happening or it happens less. So um, this is the AIDS quilt, and I saw this, and it made a huge impression on me. And I thought a lot about when something is invisible, like the gay population in the 80s, becomes visible, like after all the work ACT UP did. Well, then that's when we started to see a lot of money going to research. Of course, it was more complicated than that. But I thought, what can I do? So this is a list of all endangered species in the United States. And I started to work on these. The United States is big. It's going to take a long time. So I started with Pennsylvania, and I made these commemorative plates of all of the endangered, threatened, and species of concern in Pennsylvania. And they have silver on them, so that when you look into them, your reflection is looking back at you, to put you in with that species. And on the back, there's an essay about why the species is having trouble, and what you can do about it. Did anybody see this in NCJ? A little bit. So it was seductive, right? It was like shiny and pretty, and then the closer you got, and then you started to hear people murmur, and then you started to figure out what the hell it was, and it was horrifying, right? So that sort of worked. Now this idea to use pots to talk about larger issues is very common. So this is a Greek pot to talk about burial. This is a Persian pot that talks about prayer. This is a Russian plate, which is all about, of course, propaganda, so subtle, right? <laughs> and then of course here is Meisen, the Meisen um, pots of Madame Pompion. And Madame Pompion would not let Henry V come into her boudoir at night unless he brought her a piece of pink porcelain. Hence, tremendous pink porcelain was developed. These are burial urns from uh, China, from Egypt, from Colombia. So I started to think that maybe I would work with urns and that commemorative plates, there was sort of a question of utility that was unclear. So I thought urns, like, okay. So anyways, like how big of an urn do you make? So I called my local crematorium, and I said that my grandmother had died, and that I wanted to make an urn for her, and how urn should, big should this urn be? So the woman on the end, she's like, oh, I'm very sorry, blah, 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 blah. How much did she weigh? And I'm like, oh my god, I have no idea. So I thought, I said 120 pounds, because that's two wolves. So I was like, okay, 125 pounds. Oh, she says, so, well, now, was she in good shape? And I was like, oh God, here, get the shovel. Here I go, making shit up. So finally, after about 20 minutes, 
I fess up and I say, honestly, my grandmother died a long time ago. I'm doing this art project. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I said, she said, well, you know, she said, I, I said, I, di I didn't want you to think I was crazy. And she said, well, a little too late for that. <laughs> she said, listen, why don't you come on down? So I go down to the crematorium and um, I am trying to figure out this um, quotient, like how much ash does a wolf take, right? Like, and she said to me, well, ash is like couscous. Go get a bag of couscous and then you'll be able to figure out what a cubic inch is. I was like, great, so this woman speaks my language. By the way, her name is Bitsy and she is way into my project and emails me often. <laughs> so initially my thought is that I would make the urns the size of the species once it was cremated. So of course then the Alabama canfish is very small and the beluga whale would be like this. The urn would be like this, right? But it turns out that 80% of the species would fit in my thimble, would fit in a thimble. So that doesn't sound very good to decorate, right? So I thought, I'm gonna make them human scale. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna make them relatable to people. So I started figuring out how to decorate urns. You guys, what the hell does an urn look like? All the commercial urns are so ugly. They're just so <laughs> ugly. So here I am trying to figure out how to make an urn and how am I gonna get this thing on this urn? And lo and behold, I'm so shocked, you guys. I am a bitchin' decorator, but I cannot <laughs> render for shit. So here I am trying to figure out how to render. So I have to go take a painting class at Anderson Ranch and a drawing class to learn how to draw. And I was like so bad that I worked in the corner and there was a little high school girl next to me who said like, that's a nice color, you know? Like, <laughs> oh my God, it was just like the most demoralizing thing. So every, so I have to render, these have to, I can't be challenging anatomy on this project, right? I have to show you that I think this animal is beautiful. So I had to really, and I had to take a class on China painting. Oh, you guys, China painting is so intense, right? There's so many rules. So I started working on these urns and like the knob makes it look like a cookie jar, bad reference. And then I'm like, so they were ugly, so I made them gold. And I was like, great, that's gonna be 30, 50 million dollars worth of gold. That's kind of sending the wrong message. So I started working on this. So this is the Abergosa frog, which is having a hard time. So here it is in silver. Here it is in gold with the background painted. And then finally I kind of came on this. By having this species on an urn, which is only decorated through carving and not through color, I was able to really get somewhere. So in February, in March, I had a show in Boston of, of urns for endangered species. This is the passenger pigeon. That list of endangered species starts in 1820 because that's when the term extinct was coined. Before that, we didn't have a word for it. Isn't that amazing? And then it stops last July 1, because that's when I started making the list. So, and here's the Atlantic salmon, and the little shrimp, and the um, loon, dragonflies, mussels, and um, these are anthropods. One of the hardest things about this project is that beetles and arachnoids give me the creeps. <laughs> so I had to figure out some way of, like, because these, these take hours, right? So I had to figure out some way of looking at these without getting sick, and how ugly is this thing? <laughs> like they're slimy, you know what I'm saying? I mean, these fish are U-G-L-Y ugly. It's like the sturgeon with the sucking thing hanging out. Oh my God, you guys, I really had to um, fall in love with each species. Flies, inchworms, salamanders, wolves, lots of moths, snakes, bats, mammals, cougars, even the New England medicinal leech, lemmings, bees, and turtles. So with this show, I made a book. And in the book, there's an essay about each species, why they're having trouble and what a very normal person could do. Like, especially for the songbirds, put a bell on your cat. And then there's a town in Maine where a lot of the endangered frogs live and they're having trouble because to spawn, they have to go to a different pond and they were crossing a road and they were getting run over. So the town started a bucket brigade. And every weekend and three evenings a week, people are out there with their buckets, moving the frogs across the road. It's amazing. And now they've raised money to build a bridge for the frogs to go <laughs> over the road. So this is the show in, uh, this is the show in Boston. This is, in front of you is fish and birds. On the wall is moths. This is mammals and shells. This is beetles and whales. 
Now, you guys, this is sort of a, this is a heavy subject, right? Everything about it is depressing, and everybody in here feels like crap about it. Some, because what are you going to do, right? It's, it's a crappy subject. It's very bittersweet. So I have to say in my studio, it gets kind of heavy, and when I get really down, I just watch American Ninja Warrior, <laughs> and I feel a little better. I feel a little better. The guy jumps over the thing and swings, and then he lands, and he makes it. Oh, it's, you got to have a little relief. Recently, the tri-footed bat has come off the endangered species list. It's not always a one-way trip. The, this bat hides in a cave in New Mexico. And all of these people who, and folks who were like sneaky rustlers were sneaking around, right? And they would hide in the caves. And then the bats couldn't get their rest. And then they weren't, they weren't um, reproducing because they were tired, basically is what happened. And they started showing up at all these bird feeders. So all these people in the very southern part of, of Arizona, I'm sorry, Arizona, not New Mexico, started calling US Fish and Wildlife. There's bats on my bird feeder. They never had bats on their bird feeder. So US Fish and Wildlife goes out. It turns out that there was a new tequila maker. And they were cutting the flowers. They were cutting the cactus up while it was in flower. And so they made this deal with the tequila makers to wait two weeks so the bats could eat the flowers, right? And at the same time, ice, our all-time favorite folks, ice come, and they put gates in front of the caves so no rustlers can hide in there anymore, right? And basically what happens is, between the gates and the, and the cactus, within two years, the bat is off the endangered species list. It's just an amazing thing. So I'm here to tell you, it's a depressing subject, but we can do some things. There's simple things that we can do. First off, for birds, if you have a cat, put a bell on it. If you uh, eat fish, eat 10% less. That's it, 10% less. If we all ate 10% less fish, they would all be unendangered in under five years. Mammals, if you have any money you can put towards a land trust, that's the way to go. 87% of, of the land that endangered species live on is in private hands. So, if you ever had that. Reptiles, no straws, no plastic bags, cut them down. Mussels, see if you can get some of your local dams taken care of. Really. Oh, less than 20% of dams in North America are actually functioning. Isn't that amazing? So, uh, moss and insects plant local flora and fauna. You guys, we can all, these are not hard things. It's sort of an amazing thing. But uh, this is the project I'm working on. I'm now making all of the species for the United States. It's a four-year project, and I hope it's going to travel to the Natural History Museum, art museums, and zoos in all 50 states. That's my goal. So, that's what I'm working on in my studio. I have to say that I'm delighted to be here. I'm happy to learn a little bit more about education. Some I know a lot, some I don't so much. But um, I want to hear what you all have to say. <laughs>